Hello and welcome to the live taster session and Q&A for the Accounting and Finance postgraduate courses. My name is Jade and today I'm joined by Helen and Zari, two of our academic colleagues. They're going to deliver a taster lecture and then there'll also be the chance um, for you to ask any questions after the taster lecture. This will be during our Q&A. Um, participants at home don't have access to the camera or microphone. So if you do have any questions, please just pop them in the chat box and we'll do our best to answer them. I'm now going to hand over to Helen, who will um, do the taste selection once they've introduced themselves. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Jade. Um, can you can you see me there? Because um, I can't see myself. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay. Welcome everybody to the session um, and thank you for coming. And yeah, we're pleased to be here to talk to you about the postgraduate programmes at uh, Newcastle Business School in the Accounting and Finance and Economics um, Department. Um, so my name is uh, Helen Watson um, and I am one of the lecturers in accounting, so I think on some of the degrees. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself first and then I will introduce um, Zari, who's my colleague, um, who teaches on some of the um, more financy uh, kind of um, mathsy modules. Um, so um, I'm a qualified accountant. I um, trained as an internal auditor, worked in the NHS. I then worked um, with uh, Deloitte's big um, firm um, as an auditor. Um, and after that, I spent quite a long time working for the, the audit commission. So doing external audits of um, public sector bodies. Um, while I was doing the auditing, I um, found that I also liked doing training. So I used to do some training sessions for kind of financial reporting updates for things like um, NHS finance directors and stuff like that. And I also joined the technical department. So I was providing help and writing guidance for, for auditors. Um, so yeah, enjoyed um, doing the auditing, but also kind of some of the more technical aspects and training and things like that. I've been with Northumbria University for nearly 10 years now, which is quite scary to think about. Um, and um, so I've come in one of kind of two routes. So sometimes um, some of your staff might have come like me through a practice route where we've got practical experience. And then other people like um, Zari have come um, from an academic route where they've done a, a PhD first. Um, I um, had to study and write my thesis after I, after I joined. So I am now Dr. Watson. Um, I did a, a DBA since, since I've been here. So I've now done some of the kind of studying as well um, as having the, the practical experience. Um, I am interested in teaching things like financial reporting and auditing. Also teach some of kind of employability skills stuff like um, some of the modules where students need to kind of um, learn about working in, in teams and um, presentation skills and things like that, probably more at undergraduate level. In terms of research, I'm interested in um, auditing. So things like um, how do we know what is a good audit, sort of questions like that. Um, I'm also interested in public sector accounting. Um, okay, um, I'm the deputy program leader for the accounting and finance um, program. Um, which I think a lot of you who signed up for this are um, had indicated an interest in. So hopefully I'll be able to answer questions on that. Um, and I'm just going to get Zari to introduce herself, who's um, one of my colleagues, and um, she's got um, a kind of fairly opposite interest to me. Um, and we'll be able to help. On. We are friends, though. Um, <laughs> and, yes. and she might be able to help us with, with different questions to me. Over to you, Zari. All right. Uh, thank you, Helen. Okay, so I am Zari Aftab, uh, and uh, unlike Helen, I I have uh, only stayed in academia. So I've been a, in a year. Yeah. So after my master's, I completed my PhD from University of Reading. After that, I went to uh, Queen Mary University to teach uh, for a while. And uh, since 2019, uh, I joined uh, Northumbria University. So uh, I like university environment, so I, I've never left it and I don't want to leave it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I am program uh, deputy program leader for um, 
MSC Finance and MSC Investment uh, um, and Financial Management. Um, uh, but I do teach some modules which are offered to almost all of our uh, postgrad students. So if you're a student uh, of MSC Applied Economics or MSC Finance or MSC IFI and MSC Accounting and Finance, then um, I'll be teaching you uh, international financial markets and institutions. Um, and um, I do also teach undergrads, uh, that's irrelevant. Um, but my research uh, is mainly focused on uh, financial regulation, uh, financial markets, um, shadow banking. So my uh, I have been researching money market mutual funds. Plus, uh, now I'm, I'm starting uh, to expand my research area and I'm looking into central bank digital currencies and also climate finance. So um, I'm looking forward to talking to you. Helen is going to deliver the uh, taster session, but after that, uh, we'll have Q&A session. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, I, with Helen, will be there to answer. All right, thank you. Over to you, Helen. Thank you, Zari. Um, and just to say, I think it's really good that we're that you've got me and uh, and Zari here. And Zari's very much into you know banking and numbers and things like that, which is obviously really important. Um, I tend to um, teach more kind of qualitative discussion, critical thinking type things, um, which is also really important. And I would argue the bits of your job that is not going to get taken by AI. Um, and things that you know decisions need to be made so you need to kind of um, be able to um, have conversations and create arguments and things like that even if you are doing something that is very uh, kind of technical so um this has been billed as a taster lecture but i um uh, what i would like to do is just to briefly show you the programs that we that we offer and the, and the structures just to remind you of those and then you can ask any questions about those and then um, the session's going to be a bit more kind of um, interactive or want to kind of have it um, get some uh, feedback from from you and um, we're going to uh, be doing a little bit of talking about um, audit because that's what I'm interested in um, okay and obviously I hope that you'll be interested in it too I'm just going to share my Green. Uh, it's funny we did this all the time during lockdown, but now pretty much everything is is face to face, and I'm not as used to it as I used to be. Um, here we go. So hopefully, you can see my screen now. Um, sorry, let's just get into a slideshow. There we go. So postgraduate programs in accounting, finance and economics. Um, these are the different programs that we that we offer. So we've got six different programs um, there. Um, I think um, from when we had a look at the, the numbers of students who registered for this session um, or potential students, I should say, um, they seem to be mostly interested in the accounting and finance um, program and the um, international finance and investment um, program. So um, as you can see on there, um, there are two members of staff that help to lead each of the programs. Um, Dr. Ahmed Sahan is the program leader for MSC Accounting and Finance and I'm his deputy. And for international and uh, finance and investment, um, Pankaj is the, the program leader and Zari is his deputy. So, um, so we're um, definitely able to answer questions about those programs and we will try our best um, with the, the other programs if there is anybody here um, from those ones. Each program will have a de dedicated program leader and then a, a um, deputy to help, um, to help them look after the, the program. I've just created two slides. I didn't think we needed to go through all of those um, because um, just looking at the, the interest of the people who um, said that they were coming to this, to this session. Um, so for MSA Accounting and Finance, first of all, um, this is what you will study. So semester one, um, there are three modules that all have equal weighting. So international financial markets institutions, that is a 
believe the one that Zari teaches on, then we have financial planning control, and then we have corporate reporting and analysis. Um, then we have um, a, a break and assessment of those uh, semester one modules, and then in semester two, we have corporate financial management, then there is audit corporate governance and ethics, which is the one I teach on, and then research methods and analytics. Research methods and analytics is the, um, the one that will help you prepare for doing your dissertation or your project. And your dissertation or your project is what you'll be doing over semester three and handing it in in the, I believe, um, September. So you have um, three modules semester one, three modules semester two, um, and the, um, the, the dissertation or your project um, in semester three. Academic language skills that runs alongside in semester semester one and semester two, that is for um, non-native English speakers to kind of run alongside the, the other modules um, just to help with things like ac academic writing um, in English language. MSC International Finance and Investment has exactly the same structure and you can see it also has some of the same modules. So for example, International Financial Markets and Institutions runs across both the degrees. Um, research methods and analysis, you would do whichever postgraduate programme um, you were on and then and obviously all of them have the, the dissertation project at the end. But the other ones of the um, specialist modules would obviously be different depending on which um, which module you were um, you were enrolled on. Okay, that's as much as I'm going to say about the, the programmes, but obviously happy to take any questions on that um, later. Um, what I want to do now is start talking about um, audit um, as an example of something that we would be doing um, in class if you were on the accounting and finance um, programme. And I'm going to start by giving you a scenario. So scenario is um, you set up a small business with two friends. You reach um, invest some capital and you're all working hard on this new business. Then you're offered your dream job doing something completely different and you haven't got time to do both. You accept the job, you leave your capital invested in the business and you leave your friends to run it. So question for you, would you want your small business accounts to be audited? And why or why not? Um, so I just want to give you a couple of minutes to think about that. And if I can manage the technology, I'm going to try and give you a poll. I think I might have to. Yeah, you can still see that, can't, I? can't you? Um, I'm going to put a poll up and you can vote on whether you think you might want your accounts to be audited or not. So just have a think about the scenario and, um, and then you can tell me whether you'd think you would like an audit or not. OK, so hopefully you can all see the poll there. Don't mind if you take a minute to think about it. OK, does anybody else want to answer the question before I tell you what, show what other people have, have answered? OK, 
Okay, well, I don't know if this is because um, I said I liked audit, <laughs> but um, this seems to be pretty unanimous that people think that they would uh, like to have an audit. There is no right or wrong answer, by the way, um, but I think this is a really good um, uh, discussion point and a, a nice way to start thinking about um, audit. What I'm going to do is I want to try and get some ideas from you about why you think you would like um, your small business accounts to be audited. So what I'm going to do um, is just put a whiteboard up and um, I'm going to ask you to write some thoughts on here about why. Um, you can put the counter viewpoint as well. So any thoughts why you might want your business accounts to be audited um, and you, I'm very happy to hear any counter um, arguments as well. Uh, I'm just going to move that one. Protect your investment should the relationship with friends change. Okay, great. Any any other thoughts? Yeah, you should always be able to type on the on the whiteboard. Okay, got some ideas in the chat here. Let me put those in. Sorry, I'm talking with mute on there. Okay, that's um, that's great. We've got some. You can still keep adding ideas, but I think we've got some good ones here, and I've just copied some of the ideas in there from the chat as well. Uh, so protect your investments, um, and I think that this is interesting here as well that it says should the relationship with friends change. So we said we've got you've got two friends, but yeah, you might want to be thinking to the future. They're still going to be your friends. Um, what um, what is happening and um, with that relationship is it going to be similar in the future to what it is now um we um we've got some answers about ensuring proper accounts are, are being kept so um yeah we um we might want to 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 know that the people who we've um left the left our money with and left the business with are are keeping proper accounts credibility for the financial statements um is definitely kind of traditional answer for why audit is important i think that um in this case you've only got like and, and confidence for shareholders you've only got three shareholders potentially um actually i didn't give you very much um detail in the scenario so those are things that we um that, that we might consider 
and then issuing this proper accounting record. I think that we have um, have discussed that one as well. So basically, we are um, wanting to be sure that our friends have kept proper accounting records. Yeah, um, and particularly into the future. Yeah, um, and make sure that the the financial statements are are credible. We've only got one on the why not side, which is about it being costly. Are there any other reasons why not? I think cost, the, the cost is a very real thing for a small business. So that, I mean, I would definitely expect that to be there um, very costly. Um, also, time would be um, a consideration so even if you get an auditor to come and do their work the auditor would come and ask questions of the of the people so that would um that would take up the time and um, that could potentially be used on on running the business um as well okay thank you for engaging with that i'm gonna ask you two more questions on the same scenario and um let me share my screen again Okay, so next question is, what would the audit, what would you want the auditor to tell you? And actually, I'm going to put both these on the whiteboard at the same time. The one after that is, what factors would make you more or less likely to want an audit? So can we maybe think about those, please? So what would you want the auditor to tell you that would help you with that kind of confidence that the proper accounting records have been kept? And what factors would make you more or less likely to to want an audit i'm gonna um gonna give you whiteboard again hmm. okay Okay, so factors that might be more likely to make you want an audit or less likely, and then what would you want the auditor to tell you? Okay, so we've got quite a few answers here to the what you'd want the auditor to tell you. So if there is or there isn't money laundering, ethical issues and misuse, misuse of funds, 
window dressing. So window dressing um, is um, where a, a company um, kind of misstates its, its accounts deliberately to make it look um, different to how um, how things have actually happened. Um, yeah, checks and balances. Um, checks and balances in progress. I mean, what in particular would you want? Um, what what would you want them to check on? Um, and whether there's progress. Do you mean progress in terms of profits? Um, that again, there aren't necessarily right right answers here, and, and auditors could do um, you know could be used for different purposes. How much profit is being made? Um, people. Um, the thing with how much profit is being made. Yeah. Could you just ask your friends that? So your friends are going to be running the business and they're going to be um, writing up the accounts. OK, and um, so you should be able to ask your friends how much profit have you made? So um, a question to think about is, is it good enough to just ask your friends how much profit they've made? Why would you want to ask an auditor that instead? Um, whether all legal obligations are met? Yeah. Um, actually, in terms of so in terms of all of these things, so whether legal obligations have been met again, can you just ask your friends, did you meet all the legal obligations? Should they be able to tell that they're running a company, they can be um, producing the accounts and making sure they have met the legal, ob legal obligations. So why would you want an auditor to tell you that if you can just ask your friends? Friends might not tell me the exact scenario. OK, so is the question here about whether you trust your friends? Yeah, OK, so I think trust is a key, a key point here. Yeah. Um, OK. Have we got any points for the top half of this slide? So factors that might make you more likely to want an audit. More likely to want an audit if there's weak internal controls. Yeah, OK, there might well be weak internal controls if it's a very new small business. So that could be a kind of a, a legitimate, um, a legitimate point. Yeah. The other thing that I'm going to put up here, which is pretty much from the discussion um, is is trust. So um, yeah, also if you're lacking in experience or possibly if your friends are lacking in experience. Yeah, that could be a good reason to want, want an audit. And I think in terms of trust, maybe if you've got less trust of your friends, either because um, either because you don't trust them to do unethical things with your money or because you don't believe that they have good um, financial business experience, then that might make you more likely to want an audit. Yeah. Any things that might make you less likely to want, so more likely to want an audit if you think maybe things that things have gone wrong. So I think <clears throat> weak internal controls, that's it. Um, something that might make mean things might go might be more likely to go wrong. If you don't have financial or business experience, things might um, be more likely to go wrong. If there's uh, trust issues, you might be more likely for um, to think that things might have, have gone gone wrong. Um, less likely if the audit puts on too much of a financial burden. Yeah, and I'm going to add on there. Maybe if it if you've only got a small investment in there, so it might depend on the amount of money that you put in. So how much are you, how much have you invested? Okay, so, um, okay, I think some really key um, ideas that we've got up there are to do with, with trust. I think internal controls is also um, important. Um, friends, capabilities, and how you'd be penalized. Yeah, so it's your business as well. So, um, yeah, I think that comes into risk, probably. So we've got ideas about trust and risk. Um, and then the risk could be whether you might be penalised if, if something had gone wrong, or the risk could be on whether you've got a big um, investment um, in there. 
Okay. Um, I think I probably need to stop, stop talking about audit um, very much. Um, I've got one more. Well, no, I've got a couple more slides. Um, but I think we've got some key um, some key points there. And the other thing that I want to highlight here um, is um, is independence. So what you're um, looking at in, in an audit is somebody to tell you um, independently to give you um, assurance on things like um, whether the accounts are showing a, a true and fair view. On the bottom there, things of whether you'd want the auditor to tell you, auditor to tell you, we could think and discuss a lot more about how much those kind of things are, are realistic and what your expectations of an auditor could or should be. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for engaging with that. I'm going to go back to my um, slides. Sorry, I just need to take my time here to make sure I'm, I just need to take my time here to make sure I'm um, going to the right thing. There we go. Okay, and then just to link this through to, um, to agency theory, um, you're probably all familiar with agency theory from your um, undergraduates. The idea is that you've got a principal and an agent that have different interests. Um, this is obviously Jensen and Mecklin's theory from 1976, where you've got um, the, the agent that is acting on behalf on, on the, of the principal, but has different interests, and the principal doesn't necessarily know um, all of the information that the, that the agent does. Um, then what we've got here is a scenario where audit might be useful. So you quite often think about um, agency theory in terms of um, shares, shareholders. So the principal being the shareholder and then the agent being the, um, the directors who um, look after and run a company on behalf of the shareholders. And then you can think of the auditor as being um, a kind of a, a mechanism of, of sort of bridging that gap and reducing the agent information asymmetry by telling the principal can report in back to the principal on how well um, the agent is doing their their stuff. Um, okay. Why should we be thinking about audit? Um, quite a few reasons. Um, as I've kind of um, said before, I think um, in terms of you as um, as students, I think um, audit is is something that does um, require uh, critical thinking. And I think critical thinking is um, is a great skill to develop um, as a postgraduate and something that's definitely um, useful in terms of employability. In terms of, of practice and why we think about audit in particular, if we don't think about audit and have the theory of audit, how on earth do we know what auditors should be doing? Why should companies pay for it? Um, and how it is, do we know how to make it better? So there's very good reasons for considering audit. Um, here's another reason. Um, we've had um, quite a lot of um, scandals you're probably aware of in the past few years. Um, so the BHS audit was, um, was a, a scandal um, where the, um, the, the company um, BHS was sold for one pound, not very long after um, PwC had issued a, a clean audit report. So something like that, that is um, damaging for audit and makes people question whether audit's actually worth it, whether the auditors are actually doing anything, when it, whether it could be done better. Um, and there's, um, there's another one, um, so KPMG being sued over the Carillion audit. Um, so both of those things have led to um, very current policy talks that are happening at the moment and, and reviews that happened at a high level in, in government, um, which means that it's very relevant for, for people to be kind of, for us to be discussing it now, <coughs> excuse me, and for, um, uh, and for students to be thinking about it um, as well as um, businesses and policymakers. Okay, um, I feel like I've been talking for long enough, so I'm gonna I'm gonna shut up about audit. Um, hopefully, that's given you a bit of a taste for some of the things that we might um, consider um, at postgraduate um, level. Um, obviously, you would do this kind of um, you know discussion and, and kind of critical thinking alongside um, lots of um, maths on most of the um, on most of the the postgraduate uh, degrees um, as well.
but yeah that's that's all I'm going to say for now so I'm going to hand over to you um for um yeah any questions thank you Helen and thank you to everyone at home for joining in too um as Helen said it's now time for our Q&A so if you do have any questions for Helen or Zoe just um pop them in the chat box and we'll do our best to answer them While we're waiting for questions to come in, um, I'll just ask you a couple of questions while we'll wait, if that's okay, that might be helpful. Um, I don't know who wants to answer this one, but um, do, do one of you want to talk a little bit about the sort of facilities that we have on campus for the um, programmes within your department? Yeah, sure. So, um, so uh, within the business school, um, I think one thing that we have is trading room. So we have a Bloomberg room where, where students can, um, you know, learn about trading and we have different programs. Uh, once students register, they can learn a lot about data and, um, and uh, da data management as well as, you know, running the modeling and stuff like that. And a lot of uh, our seminars uh, do take place in those rooms. And uh, so that's one. Um, so that that's quite specific to AFM modules. Um, but also, uh, if we think about other uh, facilities, uh, we have a very uh, big sports facility, sports central facility. Um, uh, plus, there are several uh, society, you know, societies uh, to join. But I, I think you were talking more about the facilities uh within the business school right yeah so i think that's one to mention uh it's a very useful one helen uh, do you want to add to uh it yeah uh, i mean just another name um we've got a lot of breakout areas in the business school so where you have your lectures and your seminars so obviously there's lecture rooms mm -hmm. and then and then seminar rooms most of the postgraduates would probably not be in a lecture theater because the groups are relatively small so more mm -hmm. likely to be in a in a seminar room, and then there are um, breakout groups, kind of in in breakout rooms in the middle where there's kind of um, uh, desks and and computers and some kind of big screen so that um, students can work collaboratively together. There are those yeah. students, those facilities in the library and central facilities as well, but also in the business school. Um, but mm -hmm. what Zari was saying about the Bloomberg room, depending on which degree you're on the Bloomberg room is I mean it does have um it does have specific kind of seminar times in there when it's being used but if it's not already there's a timetable on the door and if it's not booked out for a seminar students do sometimes just like to sit and work in there and um, some students spend a lot of time in the Bloomberg room and sometimes you get staff sitting and working in there as well so there might even be like a member of staff that you can ask questions of and things like that so I think a lot of the students find that really really helpful and then just to add that the library is brilliant as well great thank you please don't be shy if you do have any questions please just pop them in the chat this is a really good opportunity to ask any questions that you might have um, Helen, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, the sort of careers um, that students could expect to go on to after graduating from um, the Accounting and Finance programme? <laughs> Loads of them. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's kind of traditional um, accounting um, degrees, uh, sorry, accounting um, uh, careers, accounting like um, sort of uh, graduate schemes and, and things like that and we do have a lot of uh, students that go, that go on to things like that but then I think there's quite a wide variety of other things as well so um, you know some could, somebody might come and do a, a degree in, in accounting and finance or whatever and then they decide they want a, a career that isn't directly linked but I think that we've got quite good kind of focus on sort of skills and employability um, throughout the postgraduate as well as the undergraduate program. So you'll certainly leave with a lot of transferable skills. So you'll um, you'll know how to you know how to work in a team, how to um, how to do presentation and, and things like that. Um, in AFM, I'm not Zari, you might yeah. be able to help me on this, yeah. but um, 
we traditionally yes, have so quite good links with employers and in particular we have this career speed dating um i'm not sure if this is back up and running since covid but certainly there have been um there have been talks about getting that restarted which was a fantastic event so hopefully that will happen this year as well it's a really good opportunity for students to meet directly um with potential employers yeah yeah we do have that event uh so in terms of careers for students in finance degrees uh you know, we have many many students who have gone to investment companies to uh, to uh, you know uh, so, so careers like investment managers, sometimes risk managers, financial analysts, uh, or going banking or uh, in regulation. Um, so uh, it's, it's it's like basically you know as Helen said, there's lots of transferable skills, uh, uh, and uh, these these degrees, MSc Finance and IFI, they they tend to you know give you a lot of different skills which which are relevant to uh, you know hundreds of careers out there uh, or, or you know entry level jobs so yeah um, um <clears throat> i think everyone um, does have the questions we're just waiting to see if um they come into the chat yeah i think one student has some questions if he can just write Pushal, if you can just write all the questions uh, then we can answer them. While we're waiting to um, see if those questions do come into the chat box, um, would either Helen or Zari mind talking a little bit about how um, the courses are generally assessed? Oh, actually, I think we've got the questions in the chat there. So they wanted to know a little bit more information about the trading room um, as they're a trader by profession. What, what, what in information do you want to know? I mean, it's not clear. Um, uh, so uh, we have Bloomberg room uh, and uh, you you uh, as as you said so 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 some, we have a lot of seminars there uh but there there are lots of slots available where where you can just go and yes yes so yes uh, there are several uh courses where where uh, you are taught in 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 the uh, bloomberg room and uh and so 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 the activities uh, or the 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 data uh, there's several courses who use data from there and you can use the functions that are available within the Bloomberg environment uh, to to uh, answer the questions or analyze the markets especially the the more quantitative ones like uh, like um, uh, like uh, financial econometrics um, and and uh, the uh, investment management ones so yes so uh, Bloomberg rooms uh, or the, this is where quite integrated into our uh, some of our modules. Um, just to add that even the um, sort of accounting and finance degree, for example, Bloomberg, I don't think is particularly integrated into that one, but you can still use it. So you're not yeah. um, you're not banned from the room because you don't have to do it for yeah. your degree. You're still allowed to go. There are loads of self-help guides. And this year um, we actually had um, a, a few students who weren't doing Bloomberg related module but were interested and the staff put on a session to address that so that they could um could use it for their dissertation or whatever so um so yes modules taught in there but there's also possibilities if you're not doing a module that's not that's taught in there thank you and um, the other question was sort of around um how many days you require to attend teaching sort of a typical timetable oh. Um, that sort of thing. Right. So, so teaching uh, is usually from Monday to Friday, uh, unless there is some some you know uh, other activity other than lectures and seminars is planned, which can take place on Saturday. Uh, like some 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 sometimes there are reserved residentials which would actually take place on um, on uh, on weekends. 
but it depends upon a specific program. Not all programs have them. Um, so, so, so normal teaching times would be from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, from Monday to Friday. Uh, and now within a program and modules, each one has a different delivery structure. So some some uh, modules will have two hours lectures and two hour seminars. Uh, whereas others have two hour lectures and just one hour seminar. Uh, and uh, and that would depend upon which degree you uh, uh, enroll in and, and what what each module within that degree is offering. And there's a second question for us. OK. Uh, yes, but just... if you were doing three, um, if you were doing three modules at a time, typically you'd have three classroom hours for each of those. So probably mm. around nine hours in a week, plus your academic language skills, if you were going to do that as well. Um, and then obviously you would be expected to do your own study and we would guide you with what you'd be expected to do apart from that. Um, mm. So we can't tell you exactly when your um, classroom hours would be in advance, but it's normal that students would have at least one day that didn't have any teaching on it so i think it's normal to expect that your teaching would be spread across so approximately nine hours spread across four days we wouldn't be able to tell you which four days those are because it would depend on the timetable when that would come out yes but but i think facilities are available uh you know all the time so even on week weekends if if you want to use uh, uh use the facilities on saturdays and sundays i think yeah i did one time turn up at the library before it was open but i think it's quite hard to do that mm -hmm. i was before eight o'clock on a sunday when it was snowing and there was no public transport <laughs> um but yeah so generally you can you can um, you can access the facilities whenever whenever you want yeah so, so sorry <laughs> sorry just, just the last last one yeah so it's not uh, from nine to six continuously, but there will be, you know, lectures within that time. Usually in a day, students have, yeah, students could have three, three to four or five hours of lectures. But as Helen said, it, they are spread out throughout the week. And at most it's around nine, uh, you know, eight to 12 hour lectures uh, or in class face-to-face uh, -face teaching. And we have one more question there around, um, which if the two do the departments thrive from most is it sort of a more practical or exams well all the uh well every module has a different you know has has a different structure so some but within within um a degree uh we have some modules which are offering a mix of exams uh, and individual assessments uh so it could be a group assessment which is more geared towards practical um, applications. Uh, we could have group, group, group assignments, uh, which are again geared towards practical, but even the exams, uh, they, they could have, uh, they could require you to do some, some practical uh, applications of what you've learned theoretically. Uh, but, uh, plus, uh, some, uh, sometimes you have individual presentations, uh, which you'd be required to do for some modules. And also there are some group presentations uh, and again it would depend upon the uh, program and the module yeah i think you could expect to have to do a mixture of presentations yeah. exams and assignments yeah great thank you and uh, we are coming towards the end of our session now and uh, we do have sort of five or so minutes left so if there are any final questions please just pop them in the chat um, however, if you do have any questions after the event's finished, you can also email um, ug.event at northumbria.ac.uk and Erin will pop that in the chat box um, and we can then pass the questions on to the appropriate person. Um, but we do still have five minutes or so left if you do have any final questions. Okay, um, if we don't have any final questions, um, I just wanted to say thank you to Zari and Helen um, for the session today. 
and thank you to everyone at home for joining us as well. I hope you found the session useful um, and as I said if you do have any questions after the event please don't hesitate to drop us an email um, at the ug.events inbox and um, once again thank you and hope to see you on campus soon. Thank you for coming everyone. Thanks. Um, we'll Thanks everyone. Thanks Jade and Aaron.